We're talking a little about how to, so I have a couple of questions for uh, the panel who are going to introduce themselves. Uh, the first one is, um, what, what do they think we, the business schools and the agencies and others, should be doing um, to, to work with them and help them, to partner them, that we're not doing at the moment or could be doing better? That's the first question. And secondly, the second question, um, because I feel strongly that we didn't harness enough the energies of, of entrepreneurs, what, what they should be doing for us, what they could be doing for us, perhaps they're not doing, or, uh, and, and, and then perhaps to have some discussion about how we, we move, so it's about how to, how we do things better with, with entrepreneurs. And then after that, I want them to say something about the, the first question first and so on, after they've introduced themselves, and then to throw it, throw it out to, the, uh, to you for, for, for discussion. Is that okay? Yeah. There's an agenda? So rather than my introduce you, could, could we just say something briefly about our business and ourselves before we start? Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks, Alan. Um, my name is Maureen Storey. Um, I worked in the, the University of Durham for 19 years and um, in 2000 set up my own business uh, as a, a, a web a company um, and have been growing that to be a digital marketing agency. Um, we're currently up in Gateshead with 22 members of staff. I've actually just recently taken the decision to step back from the agency and start up, up a business again to actually help small startups and, and, and businesses to embrace digital technologies to grow their business. Um, I'm also a growth coach on programs like Growth Accelerator. So together with digital and growth methods, I just want to help empower um, businesses to really to either be sustainable and uh, successful or grow if that's what they want to do. Thank you. Um, my name is Jack, Jackie Petty. Um, in 1985, when my last child started school, um, I needed to get back out to work, couldn't afford childcare, and my husband was uh, doing project work around the country, so I had no choice but to start my own business um, from the kitchen table, um, and it just it just gradually grew. Um, you could say I was at the uh, right place at the right time and fell for a, a, a client who, a, who is now a major client and I grew with them. Um, eventually, um, work from home, then got premises in an undertaker's, and this, that's a story in itself. Um, worked there for a couple of years. <clears throat> Eventually my husband joined me, and the whole family have joined me. And 28 years ago, I heard about Firm Start One, which was just starting. Thought, well, you know, I don't know the first thing about business. Have to go along and see if I can get on it. Um, I was successful. Um, did the course and it made such a difference to me. A few years later I came back, did the growth programme, only to find that it, you know, it wasn't ready to grow. But subsequently we did grow a few years later, but I had the tools. All of my family are involved in the business, they've all been on managers courses at Dubs and all the senior people that I've employed, I've put them through courses at Dubs. I'm a great believer in training and Yes, um, still here. Got through the recession, <laughs> got to the other end, um, and we're growing the business again because through the recession, where we were employing 100 staff, we reduced down, but we're getting back those numbers back again. And I haven't said what your business is. I don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're di uh, direct mail, <coughs> originally direct mail, um, but we're also Northern Mail, which means that we took a license. Um, to deliver mail as TNT UK Mail and um, it's been very successful for us and we did that about eight years ago and without that I don't think we'd still be here. Thank you. Uh, Keith Gill, uh, my market sector is fast moving consumer goods. Um, I've set up two greenfield startups uh, since 1982. 
um, and employed roughly 500 people uh, in those two companies over a period of time, which I think is one of my greatest achievements. Um, and that's it. Thanks for mentioning it, great. Isabella Moore, and just to remind you, because I've already sort of given you a description of what we do, uh, Comtech, we're a company that provide language services to industry, sort of high-tech solutions, very much focused on technology and uh, customer service. We've recently actually successfully been able to claim a considerable sum of money sort of tax credit because of the innovation the systems we also have a lot of well we have and still do um involvement family involvement um my daughter and i currently run the business my son-in-law is technical director and my husband i think i said did try to come out of a corporate um large corporate company didn't work so he's now fully retired uh, we have a staff of about 25 it's about a two million pound turnover business with uh, offices in leamington spa and in uh, london um we actually i think i mentioned that yesterday i was in that first cohort of companies that um participated in the growth program at Warwick University when the programme was uh, transferred for the first time to Warwick University. And I'm not just saying this, but it still is, for me, one of the best programmes that I just opened my eyes to. You know, I mentioned it yesterday, all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, and uh, this, is, uh, this is where we are now. Um, I think that's really all I want Thanks. to say. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Mike Sands, I'm the uh, Group MD of... Durham Associates, but I understand we're in a rebranding exercise at the moment, so we're actually going to be DA Group shortly. Um, I'm here with my colleague Tom, who um, joined me in about mid-90s. Um, I'm slightly surprised, because I'm probably the only one on here who did the MBA at, at Durham. Um, the rest got involved with the small business yeah. um, support. Um, and it was an interesting exercise doing the MBA here. I'd set up a, a, a small business before um, taking a break and doing the MBA. I have to say the MBA was totally relevant to what uh, followed afterwards. Um, but that's because the MBA was geared, and I thought I was going to end up working for PricewaterhouseCooper after I'd done my MBA or something like that. But <coughs> at, at 37, they didn't want me. They wanted 21-year-olds that they could mould, you know. So I ended up, and I, I think I learned something from Isabella yesterday when she came up with this concept of um, entrepreneur by necessity. And I'd been trying to think of um, some similar term over the, over the years, and I think I, I, I'm a reluctant entrepreneur. Um, I also think I'm an accidental leader, which is worth exploring uh, in, in some other uh, occasion. But it's, it's also, sorry, was it Jackie who said that you, you became an entrepreneur reluctantly? Well, not reluctantly, but by necessity. necessity yeah. And there's a common theme coming out there, isn't there? You know, you've got, you've got three or four companies, I don't know about uh, Maureen, but uh, all the help is being directed towards... <coughs> Um, highly focused, highly motivated young people to try and get them to do um, something entrepreneurial. And yet you've got three people, at least on this panel, that are reluctant okay, entrepreneurs. Right. Right. We're, we're getting into a sort of wider debate. Yeah, sorry. About, uh, okay, so, so that, we, we employ about um, 30 or 40 people and um, we have a business centre now <coughs> in Castle Eden that uh, a lot of my time is spent trying to find tenants for this, this business centre. But other than that, we're in similar businesses to, to these other people in terms of digital marketing, that sort of thing. Okay. Thanks. Well, well, I, I'd like to come to the first question, really, you know, and, and to, to ask you, um, <clears throat> what do you think the agencies and the business schools should be doing for you, or can do for you, and what are the problems? Um, can, can we, if you don't mind uh, being sexist, can we start with the ladies? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've been thinking about this one, Alan. Um, Can you get close yeah. to Mike? Thanks. I think I've noticed that you've, you've over the last uh, day or so, um, been upset by the term support. And I think, thinking about that, I was thinking, well, what is a better word or what? how can we better describe how we should be helping entrepreneurs and owner-managers? And I think, for me, 
It's about empowering and inspiring. So I think, you know, how can we help empower and inspire <coughs> entrepreneurs at whatever stage they are in their business? So whether that be they've got a business idea and they just need some skills and uh, techniques to use, you know, we're using different things at different stages and I think it's about presenting them with different solutions that they can grasp when it's ready for them at whatever stage they're at. Um, I think it's about encouraging them to share with each other, share their experiences and giving them forums and places to go to uh, encourage that and foster that kind of sharing. Um, I think you know entrepreneurs are very resourceful themselves and I think if they cook they come across an idea that they think, yeah, that's going to help me with my business, they'll do everything they possibly can to make that happen. I think it's just about us helping them to achieve to achieve those things. Okay, so it's about empowering. It's about being closely linked to where they want to be in the stage of development, yeah. which is very, very important. It's about building networks and relationships. Um, and, and it's helping to then be focused on what they want to achieve personally, um, which is, you know, not necessarily what the government or Cameron or anybody else wants to, or a development agency wants to achieve, it's what they want to achieve, which is a personal life. And sometimes um, that might just be, they might want to be excellent at what they do, so they've got, they do something, but they just want to be better at doing that, or how do they, we help them to be better, and, you know, that isn't necessarily always about growing. Yeah, thanks very much. And more that, profitable. Obviously, you know, a lot of businesses I've worked with, they don't want to grow, they just want to be more profitable. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. Can we go on for that? Thank um, you. I think I agree with what, what you said. Um, and I think um, it really is helpful to talk to other people who are in the same position <coughs> as yourself. It's a very lonely place to run a business. Mm -hmm. And quite often you don't see the wood for the trees. And... I think having sounding blocks as well to maybe put your idea forward and to talk it through, I think is very important. Um, and really, you know, getting ex expert help from areas that you're, in every, in every idea, it may be something that you've never uh, brought before. So you can't be, you can't read up, you haven't got the time to, to read into it. And you might be reading the wrong things, but to find someone who, is in that field that you can talk to and put your idea forward to. I think it's very important. We've had a, an awful lot of um, help over the years through a, a programme here caught with NatWest Bank Managers. And they, once a year we used to get them in. I think we just got rid of them for the afternoon, but we used to get them in. <laughs> and we would, t we would talk about the business, but we weren't allowed to give them the accounts, which was very interesting. So they just talked to us. And then in the evening, they would do a presentation back to say where they thought we were, what they thought we were doing wrong, and what they thought the future might be. And do you know, they were spot on. Mm. It was a sounding <coughs> block, really, and we got a lot out of that. And mm. I really appreciate it. So it's hope for bankers, is there really? <laughs> that yeah. was part of a relationship <laughs> management program we had where we sent the banks out yeah. to work with the companies because they didn't understand the company from the balance sheet. You can't understand a small business from the balance sheet, it's rubbish, but they can understand by talking to them. Thanks very much. I mean, an interesting point about overcoming loneliness, you know, because people are very individualistic and often are very working alone. Um, using a sounding block, being reflective with, mm. with other people, reflecting on their trust, experience. Trust their own as well. I think it's kind of having a sounding block that you can trust. Yes. And, yes. and finding people you can trust, yeah. yes. Mm. Um, it's interesting, you know, that Adam Smith um, he is, is, was a philosopher. He is regarded as the, the godfather of capitalism. But, but he, he wrote a book before he wrote, um, uh, before he wrote uh, Wealth, Wealth of Nations Nation. called Theory of Moral Sentiment. And he argued that markets would only work um, where, <coughs> where people trusted each other. And the trust-based relationships were the center of um, a successful capitalist economy. Um, but that was all based on the notion at the time of small business and informal trust-based relationships. 
you, you wonder whether moral sentiment really holds in a, in a global corporate dominated system which George Soros describes as immoral in his books, you know. So you wonder whether the world of Adam Smith has fallen apart or we continuously quote him. Theory of moral, moral sentiment. And so trust is very important. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> and time for reflection, just reflecting on your experience. Thank you. Um, the process of entrepreneurship is, is chaotic. <coughs> um, you've just heard different stories here. Uh, some out of need, some out of being reluctant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I think part of the process for the university, who has this absolute body of knowledge and understanding, is to try and bring a little bit of order <coughs> to that chaotic process. And the way you do that, I believe, is that you provide an entry point. So you provide incubation. Incubation of entrepreneurial ideas, incubation of being able to get from one stage to another, um, and also bringing in the various tools that you need within that. So consequently, the relationship between, let's say, a, a credible operation like a, a university business school could be the cradle <coughs> for new entrepreneurs um, and also bring in the services that are required as you go through that process. So when you start to talk about finance, what we do is we talk to people who are, can provide that kind of finance. Um, Ian Richards, who, who we've known each other a long time, uh, Ian's a director at Northstar. He has to work now with such very strict applications because of where the fundings come from. And we had a brief <coughs> discussion about the difficulty in the process of actually mm -hmm. getting those kind of funds. But with a little bit of will and expertise, processes like that could be channeled in, as well as recycling, you know, net, mm. net angels worth, um, but do it within an overall properly processed body. Mm. There are two areas that I think entrepreneurs need. One is the things you've been doing in the past, which mm. I think need uh, re-energizing. And that is providing the inspiration by providing knowledge outside of the knowledge of the, of the individual entrepreneur. But I think you need to add on to that a series of mentors, experienced people, recycling their, 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 their stories, assisting and helping. So there's two different levels. One is a sort of academic uh, nurturing level and the other is at a practical level uh, with the universities actually being the hub to pull in all the other services that are required yeah. because if, if you need premises Simon Goon's people are the people to go to it's, it's their skill set, it's their expertise <coughs> if you want some money from them that's not what they've got <coughs> yes. so what you need to do is just work within the framework that we've got because we talked yesterday about the frustrations mm in the bigger picture. Banking is useless, right? Apart from making its own money. But in terms of for entrepreneurs, it's not very good. Corporate investment has got thresholds. So if you want 10 million, it's easier to get that, to get, again, 100 grand. And a lot of companies need 100 grand because we must understand where the stratification is. It's not about companies that uh, you know end up employing thousands of people mm -hmm. it's making many many companies employing small numbers of people mm -hmm. and therefore their requirements are quite different and it's that whole thinking umbrella <coughs> thinking that's what's needed by everybody in this room led by the universities in yeah. my in my view I think it's uh, just to come back to that point I think it's the, the problem is we don't honour really the really small business. We always talk, yeah. the government's always talking about agencies and talk about the growth business. The growth, instead of the actual fact, the reality is it's the micro, as I said yesterday, and small businesses that are creating all the jobs and they're going to be the future in an uncertain, complex, differentiated <coughs> world. <laughs> Reflecting on, again, the, it's a chaotic learning by doing situation. 
and providing the means for people to to think out where they are, but also you know where they're going in terms of building that network of, of relationships. But that demands of us that we've got the relationships. You know, if you're running a centre, then I think you've got to say who. If you're an export centre, who do you know? As the expert, who do you know in that network? If you don't know all the people in the network very well, then you're no good as an academic to work with small businesses. Keith, I think that comes from your, your, your point there. Um, and the university is a hub, but to be a hub, you've got to know who. Be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to know who as well. So thanks very much for that, Keith. Thank you. Right, well, I think um, I've mentioned that... I'm doing a part-time DBA in uh, senior female entrepreneurship and in this process, as part of my literature review, I've had to read a lot of articles about senior entrepreneurship and generally about entrepreneurship. And what I've found, and it's, I just wish this would happen, is there's such a lot of fantastic research mm -hmm. done by universities that never sees the light of day. And to me, it's so important somehow to be able to make that connection. I was amazed. I mean, I've been involved in female entrepreneurship for many years. I've I'm an entrepreneur. I've never seen some of this stuff. I never was aware of it. So how do you get this excellent research into the sort of, in an opera, 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 um, opera, context. context, yeah, exactly. And how you can, how you can do that. That's my first point and I, and I really would like to make. I mean, I agree with a lot of what's already been said. I don't like the word support. I like the word facilitation. Mm. Um, especially, you know, I'm thinking about senior female entrepreneurs and about these latent skills and, and opportunities that are there. How do you draw that out? Which, um, again, when you think about the emphasis on growth businesses, you know, when you're a certain age, there's a limited sort of scope you have for, for, for growth. And you need, I think, to have more support um, for startups. It's all the time about growth. And I hate this term, lifestyle businesses. Yes. It's so, patronizing. it's patronizing. Yeah. What is a lifetime? Am I in a lifestyle business? It's a business that has given me a fantastic lifestyle and good uh, you know profitability we've grown but not sort of fantastically but it's it's yes. profitable which is so I think that is um, a, a big issue I think also that there is a difference between strategic intervention I think that's called transformational and the sort mm. of transactional where um, and here, I think very much my experience over the year, it's about the skill of the advisors and who is actually advising because, you know, giving a strategic intervention is, is a, is, requires a different skill set than helping with just um, the skills gap that you need in a business. And just as an example, I mean, you mentioned the growth accelerator. Um, we, we were on that. And really, the most important part for us was the opportunity to be able to use that funding to to fill skills gaps rather than the other part. And mm. I think I said before, it is so important to be able to tailor the advice to the actual business and think about it, not as a sort of you know, diagnostic to it, but really think, what does that business need? And I gave the example yesterday of our um, late middle-aged pinstripe gentleman who arrived um, at a business owned by two quite capable women and patronised and he told us that he'd solve all our problems. That's not, and you know, mm. we showed him the door basically because mm. it just wasn't what we wanted. Yes, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because we did the Small Business Centre, the university introduced us to somebody from Cooper's a live brand at one time tell us how to reorganise ourselves <laughs> and we showed them the door, <laughs> you know. Because they, they just didn't have the empathy. Yeah. I think the the word empathy perhaps is yeah. really important yeah. to 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 have an empathy to start from where people are um, to get rid of this lifestyle and even the family business. You know, so, so somehow the family business is over there and all of these wonderful high tech and other thing yeah. businesses are over there, which is absolutely different. and the word transformational as opposed to transaction. Trans to be transformational. 
you've got to get inside the motivations of what people are doing. And there's a lot of work now on the theories of management of change where information knowledge for change is not the essential ingredient. It's the feeling that people have about it that matters. I mean, I know that working with university leaders, you know, giving them knowledge about what they might be, isn't it? It's feeling emotionally what they should be um, uh, doing. That's transformational in, in change. Could I just Understanding make one, people's feelings, yes? Could I just make one other point, which I forgot to make, is the fact there also needs to be more support with regard to what happens if you fail because we talk all that you know there is you know the, is you know what does failure look what can go wrong and also on the other side of sort of at the other end of the spectrum it is about help you know thinking about possibilities around acquisitions and you know that the, the, not the sort of just organic growth but mm. other opportunities yes. that you know you hear only about about regarding larger companies but actually are possible I mean we've just we've just undertaken an acquisition and it, you know it has gone smoothly it's it's you know it is possible to do but obviously around that there are financing issues you know how you finance that you know whether it's from the profits of your business you know I think that mm -hmm. there isn't a lot um, about that sort of thinking. Yes, yes. Perhaps we don't teach how to get out of business well enough yeah. or how to get into other businesses yeah. well enough. Those are big th things that uh, perhaps are gaps. Mike? Being last on, I think a lot of the points I would have made have already been covered, but um, there are uh, one or two that I would like to emphasise. And I think this, uh, again, just this idea of um, whether you call it a family business or whatever, I, d I don't think that there's any shame in aiming for to be a stable company rather than necessarily a growth company. And I don't think enough has um, made of that. And the, the, bus the business schools could look at that more and more research could be into that. And the support yeah. agencies could look at, at that sort of thing. Um, one of the other angles and that, that I would have liked to have seen over the years is support either from the agencies or from the business school in some kind of interim management for us as a small company. Because we had the people in, in the organisation that needed and could develop the, uh, the products, the technical director, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but they were distracted by all of the ordinary things that you have to do to run a company. Mm -hmm. And if instead of having the universities provide what they think is the high-end knowledge, had, could they think somehow of providing some kind of support so that the people who already mm. knew that within the companies could develop those things further? Yeah. Mm. That was just a, a, a change yeah, round that I would have yeah. liked to, to have yeah, seen. Um, the other thing that um, seems to be neglected uh, is selling. Ah, yes. Sorry. You know, that there doesn't seem to be much concentration on... <laughs> every one of us here has had to learn about selling to yeah. be able to do it. Yeah. And in the UK, we don't regard selling as, uh, as, as a high enough regard <coughs> profession. Yeah. Obviously, they do in the States. And I would have just liked to have seen more concentration on, on, on selling in, the, in, in what the it's business schools right, yeah. could do. So uh, I think that's probably um, all that I had down okay. that hasn't been covered by other people. Thanks. No, they, I think they're the great points. I mean, it's interesting because I wanted Rose just to come to me and say, well, why do we have professors of international marketing strategy or profession of mar you know, market development? Why, why don't we have professors of customers mm. <laughs> or professors of selling? Yeah. You know, um, why do I have to brand these fancy names into things? Why, why can't we get down to the roots? And the interim management thing, I think, is a, a really interesting thing because you see from the programs outside, we used to run in the 1980s, the Mammoth Power Service Commission, when ICI and British Steel were, were making executives redundant, we, we had a program where <coughs> we knew, Mike, that if you go to entrepreneurs, they've always got ideas. But often, running their business is so busy, they don't have the time to explore and manage and develop those ideas. They're the best grounds for making ideas. So we used to give them an ICI manager, who was excellent in project management, because that's what ICI did, to help develop their idea. we give them in for six months on the manpower base, part of the transfer out package, the resettlement package that ICI and British Steel were doing. Mm, yeah, I remember some of those. And, and that, that actually worked, and some of them got jobs in that because they're excellent 
uh, doing that. Didn't know a lot about small business, but they knew a lot about project management and project mm -hmm. development. And they provided, I mean, one of the academic theories is the theory for growth of development is a theory of managerial slack. You've got to have the managerial slack to be able to make things happen. Now we have slack executives who can resettle all the people who can get in and work on that project. So I think that's interim management mm. for project development, I think is a really important point. Good job title. Um, point. Pardon? Good job title, slack manager. Better than like that. actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I like the idea of stable companies. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and I like the idea of stability and, and uh, making people w w work with companies that, that want to be stable. We should ban the word lifestyle. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, I, can I just at this point, before going to, to uh, asking what they can do for us, can I just throw it out to, to, to you for reflection or points that you'd like to make? Yes. I'd be interested to... Um, can you say who you are? So I'm Jane Shaw from People into Enterprise. I'd be interested to find Jane, out... Jane, sorry. Wait, wait for a mic. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, it's Jane Shaw from uh, People into Enterprise. I'd be really interested to find out what the panel think, the sorts of attributes that the business support community need to exhibit to support people like yourselves to develop their businesses. So what sort of characteristics should they, should they have? Entrepreneurial? <laughs> <laughs> I think... Well, let's take the... Just, we'll, take them, what, what, uh, we'll take a few questions and then I'll, I'll ask them the panel to address them. Can I have any other points or questions that, that I want to, to ask? Yes, Rilla? Really? Um, I'm Rilla Hagen, and I'm one of these uh, people in universities, but I have been an entrepreneur um, in Newcastle, actually, for a while. I have started and uh, grew a company. Um, no. It's okay now. Um, I just wanted to um, say that some of the diaspora of the small business centre uh, ended up in what might have been traditional roles in universities. And um, for quite a while, I've been, I did design an MBA that I have to say, last December I stopped. And I made, we made very sure that the the MBAs, as most of them come for international students and full-time, they come from small businesses, micro-business backgrounds, and we're very keen to go out and, and see companies. So we, um, we were getting commissioned sort of work from small businesses. It took a long time for me to get the network to put this sort of like an interim management. They would give us a project or an idea that they wanted developed, and we worked in groups, the students would work on that. They would present to the company, they, the, the, or the small business, a few of the people would come in, some were so micro. And we had to, and the students were prepared in a way that they would have the courage to yeah. say, look, you know, we've done all this for you, but perhaps um, this might be an issue. That was very rare. Yeah. Most of them have gone on to actually develop this and it's made a tremendous difference mm -hmm. and they will come and do so much work. If I want mm -hmm. them to come and speak like you are, they will come in. Mm -hmm. But okay. I had to fight and I didn't have the support myself. It really mm -hmm. killed me to try and run all these mm -hmm. projects okay. as well. So I think there mm -hmm. is this in a relationship with the universities, I don't know how we're going to do it. but um, I, th I think the, the, the notion of student projects is probably a very, a very major one in, in, in that respect. But, but the, there have to be projects. I mean, the problem I used to have business school, etc., was that the, the academic got hold of the student. So the student was, was using the company for an academic framework because that's how you marked it and assessed it rather than assessing the project on the basis of the value to the company, the real value. Yes. And that's a big academic test that to be experientially relevant. So let's move on to, to Pat. It, just taking uh, Mike's point about selling it, it, I mean, I don't know where in the discussion this morning, but you know, we left yesterday about thinking about really practical things. Um, and I think one of the things you know, I'd quite like to talk you know, for us to consider is we're also talking about power in the marketplace. And often I think small, smaller businesses um, don't have power in terms of accessing um, sort of commissioners and big buyers. 
And I think there's some really interesting stuff that has been supported by Sarah and Simon and the team, and also I'll, I'll say, because Jane wouldn't say it herself, Jane and Merrill, about getting um, creative businesses in front of commissioners and buyers at places like the Sage, uh, Beamish, mm. the Cathedral, mm. perhaps places that, that small businesses wouldn't see as being purchasers, particularly mm. the Cathedral, and yet they are. And I think that brokerage mm. and creating mm. conversations in space in relation to that whole selling, because often we, when we think about selling, it's like direct selling, um, is something that I would like us to talk about a bit okay. later. Three, three points, and I'll just stop there for a moment and ask you to reflect on three points. Um, you know, what should the attributes be if somebody's going to work successfully, personally, work successfully with you? What, what, what would you be looking for in, in that kind of person? Um, and how to manage within a company to get added value out of student and other projects, which is the one gateway that MBAs, and which we use extensively, to how to get real value out, out of them? How, how would you do it better? Um, and the, the role of the, the outside agency, the business school, in being a broker in the power structure, you know. Um, and I think that's quite important. I always remember uh, one of the guys trying to get onto the um, buying list of ICI in one of our programs, which is a power thing, you know, because the guys in ICI purchasing uh, uh, really bureaucratic and conservative, they've got a list of everybody, you know, getting in there. So it was a bit like training a politician, you know, how to tell lies convincingly um, to get into, to get the chance to do something. Slightly immoral, but it was the only way you're going to do it. But you're acting as a broker in try and then bringing the purchasing people in to really understand what this person could offer. So, you know, the, that kind of thing, but I'd like you to comment on those points. Who would like to start? Could I just, uh, in relation to this brokerage role, which is very interesting, um, Jackie here will uh, also, perhaps you'd like to comment on We Connect. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of this. This is an organization, it, I mean, its origins came it was from the United States, but now it's across Europe. It's a, an organization that supports women-owned businesses in making connections with uh, uh, large private sector uh, corporates. And uh, my assessment is, is sort of, it is very difficult because in the end, you are a small business and, you know, uh, there is the whole problem of larger companies wanting to act, uh, wanting to be as profitable as possible. And it's about big purchasing uh, decisions. But nevertheless, you know, I think there is a role for that. Um, there are issues around professional indemnity. We successfully, through WeConnect, now have two large banks as customers. You know, so it is about persistence and about help exactly in um, completing these formalities. And that's where uh, WeConnect for women-owned businesses, I think, has been quite uh, quite successful. Mm. With some reservations, it's not. It sounds great, but it isn't easy. Mm. Uh, I think that's very important. You put yourself in the role of whatever the banker wants or what the large company wants and you to create empathy with their point of view mm. and then dress yourself mm. for that acting. <coughs> you dress yourself for that kind exactly. of it's relationship and somebody can help you dress yourself successfully. I'd like to go through the, the, the other points. Well, to well I, I, I would, taking that theme on, uh, it sort of comes back to this attributes that you talked about. And, and also about this uh, opportunity to have a discussion with uh, somebody you want to sell to. And basically, I think the, the selling process has two, two levels. It has a rational level and it has an emotional level. And certainly for the rational level, what you need to do is understand where the gap is. How can you, with your product and service, and this goes the same, back the two-way street uh, where, what's the gap what's your message what are you actually trying to say how can you help the customer it's sort of tied up with the empathy piece mm -hmm. that you just talked about but the other bit as well is of course is on an emotional level 
it's how you engage with people. And so mm. both of those things can be structured and both of them can be uh, taught <coughs> um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that. But if you, just by simply being yourself, yes. okay? But when you're actually sitting down and working through your proposition, you know, you can actually tutor that and say, well, what is your point of difference? Mm. So you can coach people into thinking, well, hang on, this is going to be my message when I get the opportunity mm. to be able to talk to them. So all of this is a very process. It can be processed <coughs> as opposed to being chaotic. Yeah, Th thanks. I mean, I think it's an, another point uh, for, for academics that basically you can't be creative without emotion. You know, and when people are running their own business, it's all there, it's all the ego. When you're talking to them, it's not a rational, objective consultancy exercise. <laughs> it's getting inside the emotion and the feeling of the person that you're talking to. Um, and it's, emo it's an emotional, judgmental experience. It's one of the skills to come back to your the ability to really uh, be emotional and, and understanding emotions behind. Uh, and the, one of the problems that ac academy has is, is it wants to be objective and wants to depersonalize and be... You don't learn without emotions, actually. You've got to have emotion, emotion. You can't run a business without emotion, particularly an independently owned business. Anybody else would like can, to... Can you just refresh um, our memories about what the three points were that were raised, um, Alan? Uh, there were th 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 <coughs> three points. One... Um, where, where are my questions? Um, one was about selling. We've, um, one was about, well, you know, what, 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 what should the, the, the attributes be mm -hmm. of, of, of the person that, that is going to work with you? What, what kind mm -hmm. of attributes would you look for? Can, can I just address that one then? Because right, uh, yeah. it might touch on the interim manager idea. Because I think that um, p people sort of picked it up a little bit. But um, I think they were missing the point I, I was making. That um, what a student, if you're talking about a student placement, what a student wants to do is something interesting. We want somebody to come on in and do something that's not interesting. We want our top people to do the interesting things because they're already halfway there. They're just getting distracted with the non-interesting things. How you solve that problem, and whether you can do it as a student or putting a student in, I'm not sure. But the support agencies might be able to come up with something that does the routine grind stuff that allows the, the creative people in the business to, to do that creative stuff. Mm -hmm. Simon? Yeah. I was just saying... Why did the support agencies need to do that? Sorry. Why did the support agencies need to do that? Hire a consultant. Get an intern. Get a, a, a go to read manpower yeah, okay. and, and pay someone to do that. Yeah, well, so underlying agencies... some of this discussion, I think, is do you want something for nothing or not? So one of the theses I'd like to throw out there is academics are great at understanding the landscape and writing something Absolutely. about what I don't think they're very good at in the main is translating that to a real-world applicable environment. Well, that's that's the innovation. point I made about okay. the, the good And that's research. the point that Isabella said about tons of stuff out there, but how do you get access to it? Actually, yeah. you can access it. You just go to Google and find it. Whether you can make sense of it yeah, and exactly. apply it to your real-life environment is a different thing. So there's that point there. So should the, ac the public sector, and I include academics in that, just get out of this space and let the private sector get on with it? And if there's people out there who can do everything that you've asked of by just paying a fee. Whether you're prepared to pay the fee is another question. But there are people out there who can do that. Now, there's a facilitation role, perhaps, in yeah. knowing who to speak to, mm -hmm. and, in, and a, an education role in knowing the questions that you need to ask in order mm -hmm. to um, intelligently buy and not be fleeced. But actually, even if you are fleeced, it's a bit of a learning curve as long as it's not a, a loads of money. So actually, are we asking the wrong question? Yeah. Could I just put a comment? The idea of the innovation vouchers, um, I think this, this idea of businesses accessing this knowledge, I think it's been quite a good idea. And it, I've had experience of it from both sides. And I think that works. That sort of addresses some of this that you know, through those, it's just got to be made easier, but for um, the business to be able to access this learning, um, th this whole idea of having this voucher that will give you the, at least <coughs> an, 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 an insight into what what is being sort of researched in, in your 
with your particular requirement, I think is a very good one. I wish it was extended. Sorry, I'd like to challenge Simon Mm -hmm. because he's just advocated a silo approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong because Mm -hmm. it doesn't work. I'd agree. I think what, what, what you need to do is change the paradigm. And if we're going to start to get entrepreneurial cultures, you have to think about it in the broad sense. So that's the, what I'm advocating, is that we engage right the way through the piece, from the research, to the assistance, to the coaching, to the interim management, to the empathy, the, the whole bit. And, and, it, and for me, that's the only way that we're going to move it forward. But who do you mean we? We... The, 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 uh, sorry, the, 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 exactly, the basis of the, the symposium was about how do, you, how do you foster an entrepreneurial culture. Yes. That's, that's what we're here for. Yes. So if we're not, right, I might as well just pack up and go away. Because yeah, yeah. for me, it's wrong the way it is. Yeah. It's ha- evolved in the wrong kind of way. Mm-hmm. We've got more barriers to entrepreneurship yes. than we've ever had. Yes. And they are the, the simple things like trying to get the right funding, trying to uh, get a product idea and, and move it up into the piece, etc. Um, I come from a very different background to, to people here because they've evolved their businesses virtually from, from home. And then, and, but, but they're still employing 20, 30, 40 people, and that's very important. I come from a different place where you have a high degree of capital that you've got to lay down Right, with all the risks incurred with it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to be able to create a product, then go out and sell it. Yes. Right. Now we stand here as examples of various different kinds yes, of true. entrepreneurship, yeah. and somehow we all have the same issues. Right. And the thing is that some will have it more. You know, give me a hand with a network. Some of them will say, give me a hand with me. Yes. And some of them will be saying, well, look, I need to engage with outside agencies because I need to find solutions to what I'm doing. Yes. And, and if we're here for an entrepreneur, you've got to start again because there are too many barriers. Can, can, can I just come back? Perhaps tomorrow wants to say something. This question that you asked right at the beginning, because it's relevant to the answer about having the right kind of people to deal with. I mean, many people, from my experience in the marketplace, and many academics, um, haven't got the right culture to deal. I mean, they've come to you with, with ideas of control and systems and information and knowledge and, uh, and um, uh, transparency and all kinds of things which are not the way their entrepreneurs behave or run, and they try to impose these things. On you. I'll give you numerous examples from the practice. So we really need people who, are, when I was appointing people, to look inside the culture who are culturally sensitive to the way people are doing things. Because most of these people made up what they're doing themselves, you know, and learned. You will understand what they what they made up and what and start from there rather than what you think is the best way of running Alan, can I business. back, back so, that up? I back that very point up because I, I, I should have made it, but nobody's ever come and asked me from the business school or from the um, support agencies how I thought and how yes. I'd done anything. Yeah. It was always the other way around. This is what yeah. you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's one of the big things yeah. by counselling. Yeah, you, you, know. don't, you don't start by telling them, you ask them mm-hmm. how they're doing things. But Maureen, you wanted to say something? I think just um, reflecting on what I've learned through the last... Um, day or so, I want to pick up on Mag- Yolanda Miguel's idea of cooperation as maybe a different um, way of um, an organisation being entrepreneurial. So, if you've got a startup or a pr- uh, somebody with an entrepreneur with an idea and they're not quite sure how to get that idea, that idea off the ground, and there's lots of skills required now, especially technical skills in marketing and you know, finance, and there's so many things you have to learn as a, a brand new entrepreneur, fostering this idea of cooperating mm-hmm. and bringing specialist areas together to form a viable business to go out there together. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder if there's different ways of encouraging entrepreneurship and o- entrepreneurial organizations to start up. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going, I'm going on the cloud with the help of this young lady very <laughs> shortly. On the cloud, yeah. Am I on the cloud? Yes, woo! 
Are, are we still on the first question, Alan? <laughs> are we still on the first question? We're still on the first question. I'm going to so stop we, we are trying question. to tell these are, people. Are you, are you wanting to go on to the... Uh, no, no, no. no I, I was just trying to... I'm well, let's, trying go on, to get, let's go on to the next question. We and then we can still go back to the audience. The next, the, the next question is, what, what can you do for the, ed, the universities and the business schools and the agencies outside? What can you do or... I like the notion somebody said, do better. Because one of the evaluation things we used to use in growth programs was to ask people not do they like the program, but what can you do that you couldn't do before? That's what I was interested in. And what can you do better that you couldn't do before? And if they can't answer those two questions, we haven't really added value to people from the program. So well, what, what, can you, what, 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 do you, what, what can you do for us? Yeah? Is that, is that what you wanted to sound, Keith, on that? No, I, I just was navigating where we were in the process. So well, it's I, as simple as that. I'd forgotten that to reset. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had. Yeah, right. Right, I don't know. Um, well, should I kick off? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've probably been asked quite a few times, I mean, Mike was making this uh, comment earlier on, but certainly through Diner, I've been asked a few times to participate in, in various courses that you've done with respect to bank managers and other people and just relate experiences. Now, those experiences can be across the piece. It, it might be, you know, developing a new brand. It might be uh, the influence and role of packaging. It might have to do with production techniques. It might have to do with finding finance, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so in terms of doing that, I've been doing that for quite a while. Um, and today I've just been asked by some nice chap to talk to some Nestle-sponsored students at the University of Hallam, if I'll talk to them. Now, I do have some experience with Nestle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can put something together which has relevance to what people are requiring to try and help where they're undergraduates. Philosophically, from a, when we were running our own companies, um, we regularly brought <coughs> students in. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say that out of the six students that we brought in, five of them went on to get first class honours degrees because we challenged them. Mm. We just mm. didn't have them doing the stuff we didn't want to mm. do. Mm. We actually said to them, look, here's a project. This is what I'd like you to do. And it, it, it might involve... <coughs> A bit of research, it might involve a bit of product development, it might be involved with packaging development or whatever it was going to be, but it was relevant to what we needed to do. And what you had access to was obviously brain power, because mm -hmm. these, these people were, were clearly intelligent, mm -hmm. but wanted guidance and also to develop their skill sets. And it was our responsibility to try and help them do that. So I think from examples, using examples from that, that's certainly what my philo philosophy has been and will continue to do so. Yeah. But I think the thing that attracts me uh, out of all the things we've said uh, is this, this local community. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just sense that that's mm -hmm. where we need to go. The so very the big, community of stakeholders. We talk, uh, yes. Uh, uh, businesses, yeah. yes. We, we yeah. talked yesterday about, you know, is small still relevant? To me, it's absolutely vital yes, yeah, because absolutely. the world has got so big and remote, mm -hmm. you know, and corporate business, big corporate business, the Nestle's of this world, have a 50-year plan. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not joking. They have a 50-year plan and they have put half a billion uh, dollars aside and they, research, they, they, they look at, you know, health, nutrition is where mm -hmm. the, the, they're looking to go. So there's pharmacy here and there's food here. And Nestle want to be, attract that position between food and pharma. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they will sponsor and they'll, they'll invest in businesses using scientific nutrition. Mm -hmm. And they've bought big businesses to do mm -hmm. that. That's their 50 year plan. Now, that's what they can do yeah. because they've all got, obviously can generate the funds yeah. to do it. We can't think of a 50 year mm -hmm. plan. But that's okay because yeah. that's that's remote, yeah. right? Um, what we need to do 
or what I think we need to do, is to foster and go local and even more local. So that if we're talking about the enterprise culture, I'm not bothered about the enterprise culture in Cambridge. I'm very bothered about it being in the northeast yeah. of England. Presumably very bothered about it being in Dur Durbanside. Uh, That's where you come from. Well, the moment, the, no, my two businesses have been in, in, in Derwentside. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not, I'm not ultra, ultra regional. <laughs> I, I'm regional. Uh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a challenge of building a community that, that I think our entrepreneurs agree in. And at this point of really, and it's a challenge to us, really challenging our students in terms of the, the, what, what they do in the company and what they're doing. It reminds me actually of Croatia. Can you remember some cheats who was on the first program I ran in Croatia? It created a stink with the students because they did a growth profile of companies and they wrote projects on that, didn't they? And, and I went through the whole thing and I said, well, that's no good because no company would ever listen to it. So off you go and do it again, building all these things. Now, one of the problems is we tend in academy to mark something and say, oh, that's 40% or 60%, but that's an A. In actual saying real world, Go out and do it, and go out and do it, and go out and do it, and it led, poof, you know, and there was a row. But actually, they liked it in the end, didn't they? So she said, you can't do that in, in British Academy, because they'll say we don't have the time to send people out and out and out to make it really work. But, but you know, but the entrepreneurs working with students can perhaps force mm. the students to be really more relevant than just doing a project that they write up for their MBA dissertation. Mm. Mm. But we have, we have, an, we have uh, something where we can force people to do it and do it and do it again, learn the way that entrepreneurs do, mm. learn by mistakes, mm -hmm. learn by making it better, and so on and so forth. Okay. Just one so, idea that I just thought there, because my daughter's 18 and she's gone up to university on Saturday this, uh, this week, and it frustrates the life out of me that she's got seven contact hours um, in the week in her mm. first year of uni. I just think, why spread um, academic education over three years when it doesn't need to be? Why not challenge the education system and say, yeah, have a year in education, spend a year in the business, learn the real life world of business, and then maybe go back to education to reflect and, and you know, learn from that. But why don't we embed mm. students into businesses as part of their mm. Their university education, rather than have taken another year out as an extra idea. year. Uh, I mean, it's a, but some universities, it's not just business, but going to life. I mean, if you go to yeah. the University of Austin in Texas, then you, you'll find that every student in that university, whether they're doing sort of nuclear physics or anything else, have to take one term out to look at the relevance of what they're teaching to that world, even if it's abstract. You know, is it? relevant to the massive future or is it relevant to a problem now but they have to go out and they have to come back and talk and present and write about the relevance of what they're learning to the relevant world in which they they're in and that's now a standard thing across a guy called Chowitz, Professor Chowitz is Professor Rhetoric at the, at the University of Austin, Texas has got that right across the university. Uh, yes, you know. Yes, I think I think I have to make some kind of minimal defence of what we're doing at university. <laughs> Sorry. It's working now, actually, I think. Wonderful. Yes. The lights are on. Thank you, William. Yes, That's so a, a, a minimalist, a minimalist defence then of what we're doing in the universities. What Alan's talking about exists on a very small scale. Um, most of the departments around here will have students even from the first year going out into mm. the community um, based on a project, a set of concepts. Sociology is an obvious one, or anthropology, but it's not restricted to that. And many more people are taking a year as part of their degree, either to work abroad, study abroad, or on a placement of some kind in a business of some kind. We have the difficulty that unlike Austin, Texas, we have very little autonomy and we also have very few resources. All the Texas universities have endowments that, frankly, Durham would die for. Mm. Well, I might not go quite that far, but nonetheless. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and I certainly wouldn't go that far. Oh dear, right. So to get back to my ethical stance, however, what I, I do find really exciting is your willingness to challenge 
these models because we have almost lost that capacity in higher education. And that's because we are supposed to be, in some sense, a public good. And the, the quid pro quo in the past was that there would be stable funding. Now, as entrepreneurs, you probably think, good Lord, woman, you know, stable funding, what is that? But actually, to achieve something in a university environment, that kind of stability really matters. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be challenging and innovative, you can't have students coming in who feel that they are almost literally purchasing something in a supermarket. Mm. Education can never be that kind of mm. transaction. Mm -hmm. It has to be an engagement. Mm -hmm. And when students are being overloaded with <laughs> debts they don't fully understand, mm. and academics are being told that whatever the students want, what is most valued for the university is to somehow not go under when you have very little funding, to spend time trying to seek private funding for which you have no training and quite possibly no skills and there isn't much of it out there. And that the only thing you will truly get any status for as a university is the research assessment exercise, yes. the REF. It's actually um, an, a zero sum game, a no win situation. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate your challenges, and I feel that we're doing some things on a small scale already that we could embed further, even without the larger scale changes that, that we need. A lot of it's happening not in the business school. Mm -hmm. It's happening in the geography department. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, action research projects in the communities, which start with somebody from the local community saying, I need something. And then the geographers say, right, let's get together and we'll work on this together. And they will then bring certainly their research students in and it becomes a real life project that will also produce an academic publication mm -hmm. and an impact case study. And those are really exciting because they have genuinely originated from local needs. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. those needs may start off in one form and may change as mm -hmm. the project develops in just the way you've been mm -hmm. talking about. So I'd like to see that happening much more directly in relation to your enterprises. So how, how do you b b respond to that challenge? How do you, what can you do to enhance? Well, I, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a very good example of how that <coughs> works in our sector. So the language skills, and you all know with language skills, there's a big problem at universities, and we therefore have problems in recruiting graduates with good language skills. We are in the language business. I would say about 50% of our staff are outside of the, you know, that come outside of the UK because of that situation. So one of our <coughs> sort of what we are involved with, with our industry body is making the economic case for languages because we feel that that is the only way we will get the message across and I couldn't be in the discussion yesterday about internationalisation but to me it's a no-brainer how can you internationalise if you haven't got the language skills you can buy in English but you can't <laughs> sell you know so that's the sort of message so how we have cooperated with um, our industry body which is the association of translation companies we have cooperated with um, Aston University is we have got um, two students working uh, two working on the sort of language side of it and two from the business school working with us on developing the economic case. And I think that's a really good example of that because it's useful very, you know, it's hugely useful to, to us as an industry body because, you know, we, we haven't got the resource to actually do it ourselves. And it's also been hugely helpful to the university. So we have actually have four students um, uh, you know, at um, M MSc and ME level, helping us to develop the economic mm. case. Right. So that's mm. a, you know, that I think that that's a, a good example of the sort of cooperation. Well, we're getting to the end, very unfortunately, because I think we've probably gone all day with this. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to engage as many people as, as we would like from the floor. But I, I wonder if you could just actually succinctly, perhaps in a couple of sentences, just say to conclude you know, what you would look for, just in a couple of sentences from the outside people, just, you know, as a conclusion, what would you really look for? A couple of major points that you would really look for. What, what should we be like to, to really engage, not, not support you, but engage 
with you. Just two sentences, please, from from everybody. I'll start at the other end this time, so I'd rather put you on the hook right at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, can I say that Alan reminded me of um, President Kennedy with his uh, request to us, which was um, more like um, ask uh, not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Okay. So I think in in essence that's got me thinking because um, I, I, I guess Kennedy intended it as a rhetorical question. You might wanted some more, might have wanted some more practical suggestions, but um, it's got me thinking about how I can engage with. Particularly Durham. I mean, I have engaged to a certain extent with Sunderland um, with schemes that haven't been all that successful. Um, and I'm talking about universities here um, rather than particularly the um, support agencies. And I think that um, uh, that that's got me. It's going to send me away thinking about that, and I can't really answer that uh, question here and now. No, I think that you know one, one thing is a challenge to you. We should entrepreneurs engage more mm. with them. You know, that's your, your might, might be barriers and ways of doing that, dialogical and otherwise. But, but you know, um, we should engage more with them. That, that's yeah, I, that's I, one, th that would, making that it a succinct be. thing. Can I go on? Yeah, yeah. Um, the point I made, two points. The first one that I made about getting some of this fantastic research out into yeah. the marketplace oh, so that oh. small companies can actually um, take you know benefit from it because it, it's great and it's been revolutionary for me to actually find out about this yeah. stuff and the second one is about and i think it's to do with the fractal theory i'm not sure but we had an interesting discussion yesterday about how you can take the best out of big business and transfer it into a small business environment and that is difficult i think for, you know because we just don't know enough about it and it's taking what is best and adapting it to the small mm -hmm. business environment yeah. rather than recreating the wheel. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, well, I have a very clear view. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, we should form a union uh, <laughs> of uh, linked to the university, linked to entrepreneurs of experience, linked to new entrepreneurs and new product ideas, and form that network. Do it as a micro cluster see how it works and then take it and develop it elsewhere because yes. i think that's that's very simple <coughs> and you just do it on a small basis and everything else from the point of view of sitting here um it depends on what your business is uh mainly i've been involved in products therefore they have to have distribution they have to have remote customers okay and things like that but in today's world, you've got sitting around the table here, uh, if, if I wanted to sell a product in Germany and France and this, that and the other, as long as it's ambient temperature, so I don't have any issues to do with uh, frozen or chilled and all the expensive costs are there, and I can ship that, <coughs> right? I've got a lady who knows how to ship stuff. I've got a lady who knows how to communicate with it on a mm -hmm. web platform. Yeah. And I've got a lady sitting here who can actually <laughs> translate it for me to my customer base in Europe. Yeah. They're just sitting, they're sitting next to me. Yeah. Why can't we do that? Yeah. Because there are other Pretty people community. who are out there with, yes. with various yeah. products. Yeah. So they, it's in our hands. And yeah. we don't need any money from anybody else. Yeah. We might yeah. need a bit from Ian, but we certainly don't need any from yeah. Simon. That's really interesting. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's, really, that's great. No, we can't... No, no, just no. Well, no, I might, I might let you have a, a quick last word, but I want to go to, to this, this because we're running out of time. Um, I think the, the main thing really is um, having other companies and relating how various training has helped my business grow and um, survive. But what I really would really like a training program <coughs> on is how you step out of a business and let the new directors and your family take over. Yeah. How, how do you do that? Really how do you do that? Actually. And sleep at night and 
know that they're in safe hands, even yeah. though they've been there since they were kids. But yeah. how do you do That's that? That's a really good it's point. It's really, actually. really hard. Yeah. I yes. can emphasize with that. Really hard. Yeah. And actually, it's worse than bringing up a family, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My daughter <laughs> said to me, Mum, when you're 90, you're not going to come in there with a Zimmer frame, are you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, I think they think I am, yeah. so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get rid of Zimmer frames. And <laughs> Yes, Maureen, Ashley. I, I think just um, you asked how we could help. Um, I think where we're not very good is maybe sharing our problems and challenges. We often take them on ourselves and maybe yeah. don't talk about them too much. Um, and helping with things like case studies. What have we been successful at mm. doing? What have we failed but learned from failing? Yeah. Um, and, and sharing that information and kind of case, like yeah. case studies are just conversation, whether that be in a networking event yes. or, or in a networking forum online, I don't know, but yes. just sharing our okay. experiences more. So sharing. Yeah. You, you wanted to make, uh, this lady point. is an expert at social enterprise, and it's brilliant. So I'm going to give her one last word, just a bit, make a short, a short point, because I haven't said anything. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, my name's Linda Rutter. My, it was just in response to what you described there when you said your product, the market, could be taken by the three people that are surrounding you at that table. Sorry, I forgot I would get Mike to do right, the Mike would have done <laughs> But my, my reaction to that was, you described that scenario. Would you have been able to describe that scenario at nine o'clock yesterday morning? Yes. With those? Yeah. Right, would. okay. It's, well, been in my, it's been in my mind. The, 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 <laughs> the, issue, the issue that I had I didn't know if it was a collective thought or not. Mm. Right, okay. And I didn't know where to go to, to sound it out. So, so basically... So, but my point was that... In the majority, of, in the majority of vernacular, he's learned now. Yeah, he's learned now, but <laughs> I think... But, but I'm a lot more encouraged. Of course, of course you would have said yes, but I think what was quite interesting, whether you would have known that at 9 o'clock yesterday morning, I think my point is, it's about connecting. And when you're an entrepreneur and in business, yet you are working in your business, and it's finding those connections to work on your business at the right time when you need to either move on or struggling or surviving. Yeah. And that, that small scale pilot that you described, we come from a social enterprise. I'm a social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So connections and cooperation mm -hmm. and comradeship, if yeah. I can use that word, mm -hmm. is critical to us. Um, designing how we move forward, survive and grow. Mm -hmm. And I think from our perspective, not that there's a divide in the sector at all, mm -hmm. there's things that we do in terms of cooperation that can be translated mm -hmm. to a traditional entrepreneurial culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a wonderful book, uh, I can't remember the author, but written by uh, um, uh, a, a eminent American sociologist called Together. Just look it up in Amazon. I don't, you do know it? It's a, it's a brilliant book which actually has a lot to say about creating cooperation between people and looking at the history and the intellectual content, but also the practice of it throughout the world and over time, just together. And it's very readable. I recommend it to you if you're interested in, in, mm. in that as, as a kind of framework for that. But, you know, thanks ever so much. We could have gone on forever. It's been great. <laughs> I've learned a lot. I've got it all down there. So I might hold it against you sometime in the future. <laughs> so can I just show you our appreciation? Thank you.